This topic is about CVI and social development. There um, is a question that is not frequently asked in my experience about how CVI impacts not just the child's ability to access content in their IEP around um, literacy, pre-literacy, how it affects their motor skills, how it affects, um, you know, kind of those classic topics that we think about when we think about accessing the curriculum, but rather the equally important topic of how CVI impacts social development. CVI characteristics actually have an, an impact by affecting access to appropriate interactions with both adults and especially with peers. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that topic. You know, it occurred to me really parents kind of indicated to me that that even as their child began to show emerging literacy skills, as their child showed greater ability to use fine motor materials, as their child showed greater ability to move toward a target, that they still found it worrisome that their child might actually be at risk for um, ha being happy having a well-integrated, well-rounded life with friends and a larger community. So I began to think about this, and, and especially considering some of the risks. And the risks for a child with CVI in terms of social development really, again, embrace those characteristics. One of them is the inability to discriminate faces, and that relates to the characteristic of visual complexity. I'll kind of outline these and then talk about them specifically. Another one is um, the difficulty learning from imitation. That's a huge challenge for kids with CVI. And it embraces the characteristics of distance viewing, visual novelty, and even visual latency. The inability to e uh, efficiently interact with new materials because of novelty. There's a risk that busy or unfamiliar environments cannot be easily understood or negotiated safely because of complexity and, again, novelty. That activities that occur at distances are often missed. That these distance things that kind of enrich our lives and support what we understand about the greater world may not be available to children with CVI and affect their social development. So let's talk first about faces that we know because of the characteristic of visual complexity, the, there are four aspects to this characteristic. The aspect of complexity of the surface of the object, the viewing array, the sensory environment, and the human face. Human faces have subtle facial expressions that convey a meaning. I'll, I want to share an example of this. That there's a little boy that you'll see frequently in images in this um, presentation. And this little boy, his name is Jim, um, was at his preschool program. And I was observing him in his play yard. And he was moving kind of with an adult near him from area to area. And in one of the areas, there was a little girl who was building a tower of blocks. And Jim approached this tower of blocks and sat down near the girl and knocked the blocks over. He was not able to see that the little girl looked toward this little, you know, look toward Jim. She engaged his face, but he did not see her expressions, and so he didn't see the disapproval that she showed. So she built the tower again, and Jim, thinking this was for him, knocked the tower over again. By the third time, I kind of whispered to her, this little girl, I said, you know, you can tell Jim no. You can share with him that you don't want him to do this. And she didn't feel comfortable doing that. Um, and that, I think, is a whole separate issue on its own, why she didn't feel comfortable. It is um, important to recognize that playing near a person does not equate to knowing exactly who is present. It doesn't equate to the subtle communication information that is conveyed on the face. So it is critical that we mediate that for the child and that I share, or an adult share with Jim at the time, you know what, the, that little girl, your friend, she, I don't think she wanted you to knock that tower of blocks over. She looks, her face looks a little disappointed. Maybe we should talk to her about that. Maybe you should talk to her about that. We also have to be cautious of things like photos that I, I've seen many times in inter intervention settings where 
um, communication folks, classroom teachers, and others will use photos of family members and declare that without a doubt this child knows and can identify faces. But often what happens is that the child who's very clever and has great compensatory skills may be reading something else. Um, there is a great video of a boy named Dustin and also on the West Virginia website. And if you watch that, you'll, you can hear Dustin talk about how he can't read faces. He says, the face can be seen, it just can't be made out. How he can get a sense if somebody is happy or sad, and I think he says, or disappointed perhaps, based on some other body language, but he can't read it on the face. This is really critical. If you can't read it on the actual three-dimensional face, it is extraordinarily unlikely that the child could read it in a two-dimensional image. But like Dustin, the child might be reading something else about that image, or in Dustin's case, the actual interaction. Maybe reading something about the color of the shirt the person's wearing, the background upon which that image is shown, the glasses on the person's face, particular kind of hair, um, and so forth. We can't, we have to be very cautious that we don't confuse recognition and labeling a picture correctly with discriminating those salient internal feature, features. If we, if we make a mistake, we may be setting that child up to have a social skill beyond their actual visual capacities. Um, some compounding factors um, are that um, many children with CVI actually have expressive and receptive language difficulty. So many of the students that we have are unable to even use their voice to express um, information around emotions or to ask the question, can you tell me your name? Many of their, so we will again have to mediate that. That many of our students need adult assistance for motor challenges. So they're not necessarily able to kind of go to the place where that person is and, and show their interest. That there's a disproportionate amount of time with direct contact with adults. That there is um, frequently sort of staging of activities. And that adults may lead the play or social interactions, even when switches are used. That communication exchange may be something the child may have an interest in saying or not that it's really possibly, and I would challenge it, it may not even be a true face-to-face -face kind of communication interaction if the things that are programmed in the switches are not things we know the child's interested in even asking or finding out, that we do stage these things. And so, um, you know, knowing where the human face is is a great sc social skill. But expecting the child to be able to actually interpret that information, especially relative to these other risks, are a huge issue. Another risk that I mentioned was imitation. So imitation actually is something that, you know, we see something and then we, we learn from what we've seen and we repeat the action or the activity. That imitation is a great way to learn um, and refine routines. Imitation is a way that we alert, when we alert to novelty, we can actually notice something happening and then maybe even reproduce it. So how do kids learn some silly things like what does thumbs up mean? You know, if you put your fingers behind someone's head and other children, you know, giggle, how do they learn that? They saw someone else do it. They didn't read it in a book or learn about it in a lesson. They picked it up incidentally and they thought it was an interesting and silly social interaction. So this ability to learn and refine a routine is really based on imitation. I want to suggest that um, a lot of us do this, and we do continue to do this through our lifespan, that infancy is the time in which Im imitation begins. But we do it all our lives. And how many of us have gone to YouTube or some other website and learned a skill by watching? So an example is that, you know, I love to knit, and there, sometimes there's a technique in a pattern that I think, I'm not sure, and I look it up in a book and I think, what do those words exactly, what are they telling me to do? Yarn forward, yarn back. What do I do? I turn to YouTube and boom, I can just watch somebody do it and it helps me learn the new routine and refine it. Um, so how do children learn group, you know, games, turn taking, these so social behaviors that are very subtle, 
how do children learn things that are helpful, like this means okay, good, I approve? How do children learn things like don't put crayons in your mouth? How do children learn mealtime rituals? These are all frequently unspoken elements that are gathered through vision and that may socially isolate a child. I'm thinking of a boy that uh, I observed in a classroom, and the teacher was, um, she had him close to, the, to her in a group situation in a preschool setting. This boy has both vision and hearing challenges. And the teacher, um, he was actually wearing an FM system, and the teacher was, was, you know, had him close enough, and she was showing, she thought because he was close enough, he would get it for sure. And she's demonstrating how to, how to kind of color this Valentine heart, and what we're going to do with this Valentine heart for Valentine's Day. And she didn't really use a lot of description, nor did she kind of directly try to ensure that this boy was getting this information. And he was completely without any concept, how to begin or progress or finish that activity. All the other children with typical vision, even with other challenges, had a much greater idea of what was expected because their access to that model. Imitation is used in infants to elicit and begin turn-taking. So in, in early infancy, an infant will you know, do something like stick their tongue out, just randomly. A parent notices it, repeats it, the baby sees the parent do it, does it again, and they begin this dance that shows we have a connection. We can actually have a little dance way before the child has words. That starts because of imitation. That holds those two people together in a relationship, in a moment in time that says, we have a shared thing we can do. For children with CVI, it's a phase three skill. So until a child reaches a score over seven, maybe more like eight on the CVI range, it is unlikely that we can assume the child sees something happen and can repeat that action. So imitation certainly affects social skill development. You see a picture here of my friend um, Jim, and here he is with his mother, and she's holding her hands doing the um, Itsy Bit Bitsy Spider song with him, and you see that Jim's making these rudimentary attempts to try to imitate what his mother's doing. I took this photograph because I thought it was a beautiful, beautiful example of how his vision was supporting his ability to learn this task through imitation. Another challenge uh, that is faced by children um, with CVI is novelty. The CVI characteristic of novelty affects um, new learning in very profound and, and broad ways. Attention for novelty is, is something that is, occurs as direction to the most discrepant visual target. So if you look at the work of Fonts and Fagan and many others, you'll see lots of information about how novelty helps us learn. Novelty is a way that we attend to something that we, that occurs out of place. It kind of creates this aha moment in us, this alerting response to check it out. Um, but for individuals with CVI, their whole world is so novel very often that the introduction of another novel target is often missed. It just doesn't register because they're, all, they're looking at the novel target against a backdrop of so much novelty. It isn't discrepant. But what if the world is filled with so much novelty and that this new target is not an aha moment for the child? That novelty issues may result in the individual appearing to be disinterested. This is one of the risks that people may think confuse a lack of visual attention to the target with the interpretation, though incorrect possibly, that the child's simply not interested. This is really an issue of access. How can the child show interest in something they can't visually perceive? So teaching salient features, teaching that, you know, a cup has certain visual elements that we're looking for, that a cat has these pointy ears and, and whiskers, um, that by giving children that skill set, by giving them the content of salient features, the child now has the key to unlock some novel information, and as they improve up the range, we see that their ability to handle novelty progresses accordingly. But we can't, it, this is not an automatic thing that happens without our support. We must intentionally, directly, specifically, carefully 
personally teach this child how what salient features are and how you can use that information to solve the mystery of what the new target is. How is that target like something I know and how is it different? So novelty is a huge barrier to social development, a huge barrier. This is a picture of the family of um, Jim with his parents. Um, and this picture is, uh, you see Jim also wears glasses and his, he, uh, this is a picture of the family that, that has given me the privilege of spending um, some very sort of sustained time with them, helping them plan Jim's CVI program. Jim is a child who has actually progressed to very high level on the CVI range, and we'll see some more pictures of him as we progress. This is that same little boy who's now in a playground, and you see this image, this is a striking image to me that his mom sent just of Jim playing, um, and uh, here he is playing at a sand table on a playground. You'll see in the background there are other children who look like they're about Jim's same age. But you'll see that Jim is surrounded, one adult, his mother on one side, his grandmother on the other side. And that they are completely focused on Jim, who is playing with the sand. And kind of the job of these adults is to negotiate his play to help him you know, um, get more sand when he wants it, help make a shape, make a form to mediate that play. But you see it is not in any way even in consideration of other children on the playground because Jim's not quite there yet. This picture represents how we as adults may um, provide this amazing, great support to the child, but we have to remember that this is not where he stays, that we hope that eventually the adults move further and further away, and that Jim learns some skills to help expand his social play and um, his social relationships over time. This is a video that shows um, Jim in a play activity. In this short video clip, you'll see, and it actually starts out disoriented. I apologize for that. It's sideways and then it turns forward. But it's, so I apologize for the orientation of the video, but I wanted to use it because it shows how Jim is engaged in this ball playing activity with his grandmother and he's having a great time. And his grandmother does everything to make sure this ball goes directly to him and that he's successful. And it is a very much a one directional activity. Now given Jim's age in this video, it's probably kind of borderline okay that he still has these kinds of activities, very adult directed. But eventually we really want Jim to, to span out and be able to play with a peer and be able to be in a situation where both children are working together, doing a little bit of cooperation, solving some problems, locating the ball when it goes beyond his arm's reach. It's just an example of how we all, I think if we step back and think about this, we can all see that we have done this many, many times with children. Um, in terms of helping just kind of organize and support their success, their 100% success in a play activity. So parents, therapists, teachers, teaching assistants, support staff um, are recommended, I recommend, that they try to learn to become quietly available. This is a term that I use that indicates kind of this ability to step back to get out of the zone of being within arm's reach of this child and to to wait until the child has a chance to solve the problem to move in to help support the development of materials and environments so the child can can have appropriate interactions and experiences but to not hover to not helicopter and to not be um, and to not think that they are failing in their teaching or supporting if they are not hands-on with the child. It's critical that the child have time to figure this out on their own. That we hope that these adults also facilitate, mediate, and frame an experience with another child. So when a child goes into a preschool class, an elementary class, a high school class, that we can actually talk about how 
what's going on. So in this room right now, Joey, there are four areas. And in this area, one area they're working with art supplies. I think they're painting, maybe on a light box even. And this other area, they're doing something with balls. They're you know playing a game with balls. And this other area, they're doing something on the computer and so forth. That we, that we actually, first of all, paint the picture of what's happening. And that we stand between the child and that experience to help frame it and help the child get a sense of what they want to do. And even if the child is nonverbal, the child will indicate to you if you give them the right kind of communication framework, it's very likely they're going to indicate what they want to do. At the very least, give them a variety of experiences. You know, kind of free time should not mean free time with my paraprofessional. It should mean free time in the way that is like the community of that classroom. We want to provide verbal descriptions of remote information that all of us, parents, therapists, teachers, teaching assistants, support staff, we really, it's critical that we let ch children know what is happening far away so that they, even if it's not something they're going to immediately participate in, that they get the opportunity to know what is happening. That is enriching information that they may not get otherwise. Be careful not to play for the child with CVI, but describe the experience, the children present, and the activity. Parents that I have met do not appreciate a paper that comes home, an art project that comes home, a Mother's Day card that comes home that is clearly 100% done, hand over hand, or even without the child's participation. They would. It's been my experience that parents so prefer that one that really reflects what they think their child could do. Um, it's important that we help the child with CVI understand consequences. And again, we rescue, 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 rescue. Instead, if the child continues to, um, you know, if you've said to the child, if, if, you know, if, you keep, if you knock that cup off one more time, I think you're going to tell me that you're really done having a drink right now and the child knocks the cup off one more time and we give it right back to the child because somehow in our heart it just doesn't feel right to restrict that. If you set up a consequence, you are supporting that child's social development by following through with what you've asked of them. Don't make the standard different. Don't lowball that child's social opportunities. Give the child an, an experience that you think actually challenges them pretty much based on their age and abilities. And then finally, back off. This is often really hard for us. Um, I've just noticed with the characteristic of latency how hard it is for people to do nothing, to wait. But it's critical that we learn that we need to take a step back, sit on our hands, put tape over our mouth if we need to, and simply wait. Give the child an opportunity. Back off. In other words, the child deserves what I call the dig dignity of failure as well as the dignity of su success. That if we think about how children grow and develop emotionally and socially, they learn to recover from things that don't go their way in order to integrate that into the sense of themselves and their growing sense of competence. That if we always, always make sure that somebody has their arm on that child to make sure they can do this, if we always play a game with the child and the child with CVI wins, if we always make sure that the little girl who's building the towers, no matter how disappointed she is, we certainly don't want to upset the child with CVI. Yes, we do. We want to make sure that child understands what's happening. And, and even the concept of time out is fine if that is within the parameters of what you've asked other children to do. So remember that this child's successes are really only reflected against the non-successes. So make sure the child has, grows emotionally and socially through both. Hopefully, by doing so, the child can participate in non-adult interactions. It breaks my heart, really. It makes me really wonder what I've done wrong, what I've, what I've failed to communicate to a team when a child really just follows the adults around or requests the adults or uses their device to constantly ask an adult to come by with total disregard of the peers in their room. I think we have failed that child at some level. 
Hopefully the child will also solve simple social problems, that they'll negotiate some of these simple social interactions and learn, oh, it's not my turn. I have to wait. Um, that they'll recover from disappointment and grow from it. These are things I think we would ask of any child. That they learn to ask questions using either their voice or their communication, their alternative communication methods, and advocate for their own needs. So that ultimately that little boy who was watching that Valentine heart activity can speak up and say, excuse me, I can't see that. Or use their switch and say, I need some help. Because that will actually give that child a sense of internal strength and fortitude that shows them that they are worthy of being included. They are worthy. So this is a picture of that same little boy, Jim, and a, you know the same little boy who had difficulty knowing that there was a person nearby who wasn't happy about their tower being toppled, um, interacting in a very just sort of free play activity with a, a peer. And it's, it's a picture that his mom sent me that just delights me because this is not something that Jim could always do. He couldn't always just be in the presence of another child and really even tolerate it terribly well. Another challenge to social development is distance viewing. That activities that occur beyond arm's reach can spark curiosity and, re and result in approach behaviors. Why do I, you know, if, some, if there's an ice cream truck that pulls up, you know, probably going to have to stop this taping so that I can go get ice cream. You know, we are, re we, we, certain things that happen beyond, beyond arm's reach actually rise to the top of our importance list. They create, they spark curiosity. They result in these approach behaviors. They give us a sense and a reason to reach out beyond our, our little bubble, our egocentric world of our own little space. Kids with CBI have terribly difficult challenges with distance viewing, and we know that the ability to see targets at 20 feet or beyond reliably is a very high phase three activity because of complexity. So what do those children miss? They miss all the rich, subtle pieces of information that other children get. So we, you know, I think about a child who was on a playground. This is a child who can actually read. When he went out on the playground, he certainly did not look the same as he did in his near space world. And <coughs> as the children began to sort of disperse and go onto various pieces of equipment and form little groups and start up a little game, he really just went to the fence of that play area and began to kind of interact with himself. If he had a better sense of what was going on in that space, there's a great likelihood that he would have had a desire to be part of one of those groups. Children with CVI miss opportunities and may tend to repeat experiences and stay within the known. Again, making them look very different than other children who love novelty and who want to be sparked to go try the new thing, who maybe even compete with other children for the newest ball on the playground, who, who want to you know, interact with this new image on the, on the computer during a leisure time activity. But again, if you're not perceiving that at the distance, you may kind of re resort back to those things that are reliable, that are consistent, and that you know you can actually do. Again kind of like having children with CVI look a little bit like their abilities are lower. They can, may go to a lower level of play, a less mature level of play than they're actually capable of. So the impact of safety and danger is another um, aspect that must be discussed. That visual field differences, especially lower visual field differences, including other visual field issues, can place this child at, at risk. That there are times when Safety is really part of the reason why an adult is afraid to be further than arm's reach away from this child, because they may not, in their wheelchair, notice that there's just a little lip that they're going to go down, and that's going to make them topple and get hurt. That the child who's, who's independently ambulating may not see that step and could get seriously injured. That if they are have a, a, a lateral field loss, and there's a radiator that's on, and it's hot, the child may not perceive, they may understand intellectually not to touch it, but if they don't see it, they may move over in that direction and get hurt. There are children who actually move into the direction of a moving swing 
because they don't see very well at that side, that particular side, and the, the swing may actually hit them or the ball may encounter their face before they even know it was coming. So this is where we can help um, by thinking about the use of a cane, where we can teach, use map skills to help a child understand a space so that they're not just in the moment in a space, but when they're in a place, they can relate themselves to what's next to them, what's in front of them, what's behind them, what's next to the thing next to them, and begin to build a representation of space in a way that gives them much more freedom. And again, teaching salient environmental features will help a child anchor themselves to something that helps them know, okay, I see there's that bright orange door, and that bright orange door is the door we go in after recess. Helps orient the child. Um, visual latency can impact safety. Again, as I mentioned, the children may not perceive the threat, the threat of the moving target, the, obst the obstacle, the interaction until it's too late. Again, that projected ball, that moving swing, that child running or darting in front of them may actually become a threat, an obstacle. And buddies. Let's talk just for a moment about buddies, friends, pals. Um, friendships with, for children with CVI may have to be facilitated initially. So that picture that we saw of Jim with his buddy you know, behind him and Jim's just beaming from ear to ear, um, this did not happen because Jim said, you know, I'd like to have so-and-so over to play. This is something that was really set up through a play date, through an organized, arranged activity. I think that his mom and dad and extended family actually had to go to try a number of buddies until they found one that actually seemed to play pretty well with Jim, that was actually able to kind of interact with him in ways that drew both children out appropriately. Um, avoid caretaking of a child in favor of a more balanced interaction. And again, this concept of the dignity of failure. You know, this concept that this is mine because I've always had everything I need right in front of me. Adults give me everything I need. It can be a very important lesson to learn. No, actually, he has it now and he's taking a turn. Uh, we, we don't want to consider the lack of conflict as a goal between children. Conflict between humans can be a really tough thing, but something that helps us grow. So help the child with CVI learn to negotiate those differences rather than avoiding them. In the beginning, sometimes a slightly younger child may actually be that first buddy. I do want to say just a word here, though, about my experience in the early years with children <clears throat> in classrooms. There is this tendency, um, and I think probably others have seen this, for the little girls in a classroom to mother this child who has special needs. In this case, we're talking about CVI. We want to keep our eye on that too because caretaking, even by other children, is not the same as having a more balanced interaction. Um, and adults can help negotiate that. This is a picture of, again, Jim, this is an amazing change that is not often seen. Uh, this is a, a definite change in Jim's life where you see Jim sitting on this little push toy and he's there's another child next to him and Jim is pointing out he's pointing in the direction of something and both boys are together regarding the same target this is Jim is in phase three so this is possible for him um, but the social piece did not come just by virtue of Jim being in phase three it came through a lot of hard work one of my favorite photos recently is this one of Jim on a swing side by side with a buddy and they are actually their heads are sort of turned in the direction of one another which shows a shared experience there is no adult there sitting on the swing with Jim in their lap um, consider positive self-awareness that we want to help the individual recognize their abilities as well as their challenges in naturally occurring opportunities so there there is a phenomenon that sometimes occurs and I'm going to use the phrase that was kind of brought to my attention that that it was stated that you know Jim doesn't even know there's anything different about him and I I took the opportunity I actually hesitated for a moment but I thought we probably should talk about that that Jim probably should know there's something different about him but it's not a good thing or a bad thing it's just a thing and that thing is his vision is different. And so when other children can get to that ball before him, either because of his motor issues or his vision, 
Well, that's not because they're smarter or more clever. It's just that they can see it faster. So we want to make sure that we help him understand socially that he's not less than. He just has some issues we have to think about how we're going to get around this. Okay, that self-esteem and self-image are at stake. And that if he always is the last child and we don't tell him why, that we have not probably done our job to help him develop socially, to understand all that is Jim, all that is Mary, all that is Susie, in ways that help the child integrate a positive self-image. Realistic self-perception is a healthy goal. And the last slide shows one of my favorite pictures, which shows Jim sitting in a car, in the back seat of his car, and he is, um, you probably got a sense that Jim does not live in the United States, and he's looking at, as a child in phase three, he's looking at a simple book. He loves now some information in two dimension. He's actually examining this book. This is a huge success. But as he's going, you see there's an image out the window of Stonehenge. And it's, it kind of reminds me of, you know, this information that what most people now know child his age would be really interested in Stonehenge. But it kind of serves as this funny little example for me of how if we only help children pay attention to what's right in front of their face, if we only focus on these academic, pre-academic, functional, whatever curriculum a child's in, tasks, we may sometimes miss the most important event, which in this case for children with CDI may be their larger social world and context. Thank you.